Hi, and welcome to this video introduction to cancer epidemiology. This will be a short overview looking at what exactly cancer epidemiology is, the history behind its development, and a brief section on what epidemiology has told us so far about the causes of cancer. So far we've learned that cancer is the result of genetic changes, but what environmental exposures make these changes more or less likely to happen? And are any of these causes preventable? Epidemiology is the study of the causes and distribution of disease. Rather than looking at individual people, it focuses on groups of people or populations. In the case of cancer, it is concerned with which groups of people get cancer and who don't, and how these groups differ, as these differences might tell us about the causes of the disease and ultimately what can be done to prevent it. Epidemiologists are also interested in how disease is distributed through a population. In other words, who is at risk? When are these groups at higher risk? And in which locations are people at higher risk? In identifying these associations, it aims to work out whether these associations are because the factor is causing the disease or whether it's just a coincidence. It's really important to hammer home at an early stage that just because you spot an association between a certain exposure and an outcome, and in this case we're talking about whether people get cancer or not, it doesn't mean that one thing is necessarily causing the other. This is all, all, all too often mistaken in the wider media. And as a result, there is a lot of confusion over the causes of many diseases, especially cancer. Finally, the ultimate aim of all of this research has to be the question as to whether anything can be done to prevent the disease. When looking at where we currently are in terms of cancer epidemiology research, I feel it's useful to know where we've come from. The first point to make is that although cancer is not a new disease, real knowledge of its causes really isn't. The presence and recognition of cancer as a disease goes back a long, long time. As we can see in this picture here on the left, evidence of metastatic prostate cancers have even been found in ancient Egyptian mummies, this one dating back to around 2,200 years ago. In the time of Hippocrates in ancient Greece, many types of tumour had been recognised. Hippocrates clearly stated his idea that their development was related to environmental influences. However, he also thought that cancer was a product of the build-up of black bile produced by the stomach and spleen. It wasn't until the time of the Renaissance, a long time after Hippocrates, that people began to challenge his ideas and move the study of cancer epidemiology forward. This man, Bernardino Ramazzini, wrote a book in 1713 where he postulated that the reason nuns were more likely to develop breast cancer was because of their celibacy. This is an idea that amazingly holds up even today. We now know this is because of hormonal influences. In 1775, a man called Percival Potts recorded an association between scrotal cancer and chimney sweeps. This was considered one of the first milestones in the development of modern epidemiology. For the first time, an occupational or work-related cause was identified for a disease, with the possibility of prevention. Later, the surgeon Henry Butlin continued the work by observing that scrotal cancer was almost exclusively an English disease. It was almost unheard of on the European continent. He thought that this was most likely due to a lack of protective clothing that was used in the rest of Europe. He used what we now call a natural experiment by comparing the groups of chimney sweeps in different countries. Where epidemiology really came into its own was the 20th century. Later experiments after the Second World War, along with the development of statistics, led to scientific proof that cigarette smoking was a risk factor in the development of lung cancer and dies in bladder cancer. Richard Dole, who you can see here, used data from a large natural experiment called a cohort study using doctors of subjects to prove the link between cigarette smoking and cancer. Clearly, it's taken a long time, development and refinement of research and statistical techniques to work out what we know about the causes of cancer. And even still, a huge amount is unknown. Which might come as a bit of a surprise to you if you were to believe everything you read in the newspapers. As a quick aside, I thought I'd show you this great site called the 
new Daily Mail Oncological Ontology Project. A list someone has compiled on a website of all the things the Daily Mail has blamed for causing and preventing cancer. For those of you not based in the UK, the Daily Mail is a tabloid newspaper with a somewhat questionable reputation for quality journalism. If you were to read the Daily Mail and lots of other sources around that, the internet for that matter, you might start to believe that everything and anything can cause or even cure cancer. The internet is equally awash with spurious information with regards to cancer causes. I've listed a few examples here that the Daily Mail has printed. You might even have noticed, if you look carefully, that some things like coffee are even listed as both a cause and a cure. And here on the right, you can see that even things like social media, including Facebook, has been blamed. So what makes the difference between a simple observation and scientific proof of cause? How are we, the poor, confused public, supposed to work out what's true or not? Again, we come back to the previous point. Just because there's an association between two factors doesn't mean that one is causing the other. Epidemiology is the only means by which we can scientifically prove the effects of exposure to a risk factor and whether it is causal and not just a coincidence. Most epidemiological studies look at whether a certain factor, called an exposure, affects a specific outcome, in this case cancer. The factor could either increase or decrease the risk of getting cancer. At the beginning of a study, both the exposure and the outcome have to be clearly stated. In this example, I've taken one of the suggestions from the previous slide. So we might ask the question, is an increased exposure to eating ham sandwiches associated with a high risk of develop, developing colorectal cancer? As you might be beginning to realise, it isn't enough to simply collect data on the exposure and the outcome, i.e how many ham sandwiches people eat and whether they're more likely to get cancer. Our environment is very complex and many factors are at play. The exposure we're looking at here, ham sandwich consumption, could also be linked with an increased rate of another exposure, for instance, mayonnaise consumption. How then do we know whether a supposed link between eating ham sandwiches and cancer is actually down to eating ham sandwiches or because the people who are eating these ham sandwiches are also eating lots of mayonnaise in their sandwiches. This is an example of something that's known as confounding. The confounding factor here being mayonnaise consumption. You couldn't prove that ham sandwiches can cause cancer without showing at the same time that the relationship cannot be explained by mayonnaise consumption or any other confounding factor you can think of. I'm not suggesting that ham sandwiches or mayonnaise, in fact, do cause cancer. This is just obviously the example I'm using. But you might be starting to see how difficult it is to prove that something causes cancer. We live in a complex environment with lots of factors that might be influencing outcomes. How do we account for these? The best experiment designs for accounting for uh, confounding factors are randomised controlled double blind studies. But ethically, you can't set up experiments where you deliberately expose a group of people to something that you might suspect causes cancer. This is why epidemiology has to utilise natural experiments, observing people who are already exposed to a given exposure and compare them to people who aren't. Confounders have to be dealt with by designing studies that account for these confounding factors, collecting large amounts of data about the confounders and using statistics. In epidemiology, these tend to either be studies known as cohort studies or case control studies. We'll talk about these more in future videos. So what has epidemiology told us? I can't list every single theoretical cause of cancer here, but I thought I'd mention a few examples of risk factors that have been backed with substantial proof. There are very few exposures that can be blamed for causing cancers all on their own. Usually cancers are the result of an exposure to a number of different factors, so it's probably more appropriate to think of these as risk factors. Around 40% of cancers are thought to be driven by preventable factors, the most important of which I'll mention here briefly. It's been estimated that obesity may account for approximately 14% of cancer deaths in men and 20% in women. Alcohol abuse 
alone increases the risk of carcinomas of the mouth, throat, larynx and esophagus and, via alcoholic cirrhosis, the liver. Smoking, particularly that of cigarettes, has been implicated in cancers of the mouth, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, pancreas and bladder, but most significantly, it's responsible for about 90% of lung cancer deaths. Smoking is the single most important preventable risk factor associated with the development of cancer. Around 1% of cancers have been linked to low levels of physical activity, otherwise known as a sedentary lifestyle. Diet also has an influence. There is evidence that a high level of consumption of red and processed meats is linked with a higher risk of colon cancer. There is some evidence that a high intake of fruit and vegetables may reduce the risk of certain cancers including mouth, throat and lung. However, this hasn't been proved beyond doubt. Some infections are known to increase the risk of cancer, most notably human papillomavirus, which is linked to cervical cancer. Exposure to certain hormones have been linked with higher levels of certain cancers, the most obvious being oestrogen and breast cancer. 4% of cancers in the UK are caused by occupational exposures, in other words they're related to someone's work. Asbestos was used in the past as insulation and was commonly used in the construction and shipbuilding in industries. Breathing in fibres has been strongly linked with the development of cancer of the lining of the lung, called mesothelioma. Asbestos was banned in the UK in 1999. Ionising radiation is also a risk factor for cancer, particularly leukaemias. Radiographers, clinicians who perform scans, are obviously at higher risk as well. Working outdoors, more specifically sun exposure, increases risk of sun, uh, skin cancers. There's also pre preliminary evidence that shift work might also increase the risk of cancer, particularly breast. Some risk factors aren't preventable, one being age. Most cancers occur over the age of 55, and this makes sense as it takes time for genetic changes to accumulate before cancers develop. Exposure to various risk factors might speed up this process. Genetics also play a significant part. Specific genetic profiles that are inherited may increase or decrease the risk of someone getting cancer. Many geographical associations have also been observed by epidemiologists. For example, stomach cancer is eight times more common in Japan than in the USA. Lung cancer is two times more common in the USA than Japan. And skin cancer is six times more common in New Zealand than Iceland. Most of these associations are due to environmental factors. And we also know this from studies of immigrants. For example, when we look at the rates of stomach cancer in Japanese people who have moved to America, with every generation, the risk gets closer to that of people whose families have lived in America for years. So this was a brief tour of cancer epidemiology to get you acquainted with some of the basic principles. Cancer epidemiology tries to identify risk factors and devise preventative me measures by comparing groups of people in what are known as natural experiments, which look at the relationship between exposures those people might have whilst accounting for confounding factors and whether or not those exposures are related to an increased or decreased risk of cancer. Proving any exposure causes or prevents cancer is hard. It takes a huge amount of work and statistics and has its limitations. Always question the evidence. There's a lot of uh, misinformation with regards to the causes of and cures of cancer. And there are many people with a vested interest, financial or otherwise, in making you believe false information. Epidemiology has grown in the last century and has told us a lot about the risk factors for cancer. By addressing preventable factors, which are supposedly responsible for up to 40% of cancers, we can begin to find strategies to reduce the rates of cancer development. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, um, you can help us out by clicking on the subscribe button, clicking like, and checking out any of the other videos on the channel. Cheers. So this was a brief tour of cancer epidemiology to get you acquainted with some of the